Um, I'm going to start off talking about Medicare incentive and, and programs. One other qualifier I'll have to say is a good bit of the afternoon, not a good bit, but a certain portion of the afternoon program Dr. Media was doing, and these were his slides, so uh, doc, doc, Dr. Garrett and I will, will fumble through it, but we know enough about it to be able to talk about it fairly knowledgeably. But anyway, on Medicare incentive pe penalty programs, um, they've kind of changed everything in that, around now with MACRA. Everything was referred to as PQRS. This is really the end of PQRS is this year, and everything's going to be transitioning to, um, to uh, the, the stuff that was created by MACRA. MACRA is the name of the law. QPP is the name of the quality program. And QPP applies to both MIPS and the alternate, alternate payment model um, parts of, uh, of, of MACRA. So, QPP is kind of the umbrella term, and then MIPS and APMs come underneath that. And of course, QPP is the piece that repealed the sustainable growth rate, and there's a lot of people who complain and say, oh, we were much better under sustainable growth rate. Well, that's just dumb. It's not true. You know, the maximum penalties under uh, when, when, when uh, the PQRS was out there we were up to like 13 14%. The maximum penalty you can have under this is 9%, plus we got rid of the whole having to lobby for the sustainable growth rate happening. So we're definitely in a better place, and that's just math. But anyway, so as noted, there are two tracks there, MIPS or APMs. And the APM is the alternate payment model. It's an approach that gives added incentive payments to provide high quality and cost efficient care. APMs can apply to a specific clinical condition, a care episode, or a population. I can tell you RPA right now is working on an APM for uh, kind of early onset ESRD for the time period leading up to ESRD and then the first 180 days of a person's ESRD condition because we believe that's the time when you can demonstrate savings and positively impact a patient's outcomes. Um, now the MIPS part, MIPS stands for Merit Based Incentive Payment Program and it includes submission of evidence based and practice specific quality data for 2017 most people are going to be in in uh, most nephrologists are ex expected to report under MIPS a whole lot a large portion of all Medicare providers are going to be in MIPS and there was some argument about everybody trying to find their ways into APMs and that would be a good thing because there are bonuses and you don't get to do a lot of the MIPS reporting stuff if you're in an APM but if you did pretty well under the PQR, PQRS and meaningful use and those kind of things, you're probably going to be j just fine under MIPS. And when I say just fine under MIPS, you're not going to like pay a big penalty or anything like that, but I'll talk about that more in a little bit. So the QPP, as noted, replaces PQRS, meaningful use, and the value-based modifier. All those things you know, are in place. And for 2017, as of right now, there's this thing called the Pick Your Pace program, where you choose how much you want to participate in MIPS and if you really don't want to do anything for the first year and see how things shake out, you can just report one quality measure in each of the domains and you'll be held harmless. There'll be no penalty. So it was a really good idea that CMS did this pick your pace thing. And we're lobbying for them to include it in 2018 as well so people have more time to adjust. Um, who is eligible to participate? Pretty much everybody. Um, if you're in an advanced APM or if you bill Medicare more than, I think that's supposed to be less than $30,000. Uh, you're, you're part of QPP if you're in an APM or if you bill more than $30,000 in Part B services or provide care for more than 100 patients. So if you do less than those things, you're not subject to MIPS, MIPS but if you do more, you're in. Um, and then you've got to do the, uh, the mil minimum billing and the number of patients to be in the program. But Really, any Medicare provider is going to be in there. So you see the types are physician, physician assistants, nurses, clinical nurse specialists, certified uh, nurse anesthetists. Um, there are the four components for MIPS, quality improvement activities, um, advancing care information, which is the new meaningful use, and then the cost component, although the cost component was, uh, was not implemented for the first year, so there's not going to be any part on cost. And this was a pretty good policy idea because how much can physician practices impact the costs of things like drugs or whatever? You really can't. So CMS had the wisdom to say we're not going to do that for the first year. Um, so you see that, that means that the category weights got spread over into the other categories. So the quality uh, category is 60%. Advancing care information, again, the new meaningful use is 25%. And the um, improvement activities, and this is things like having a patient portal or doing that kind of stuff that you know, in, sort of improves the patient, in, or the patient interaction with the practice is what's captured under the, um, the improvement activities. Um, 
Again, advancing in care information uh, replaces meaningful use, but includes a lot of its elements. It's kind of funny, about a year ago this time, the, uh, the then head of CMS, Andy Slavitt, said, meaningful use as we now know it is over. And everybody's like, yeah, tell me another one. You're just renaming it. And the other funny story behind this is that apparently they wrestled with what to name advancing care information like up until the day the proposed rule came out because they knew meaningful use was like a toxic phrase that they couldn't use anymore. So they came up with something and it's advancing, advancing care information. But anyway, uh, a report is required. The required report base score measures a security risk analysis. And these are things that should have been being done under meaningful use. So it shouldn't be like new news to anybody. E-prescribing, providing access, doing a, uh, sending a summary of care and requesting and accepting, accepting a summary of care. And you report up to nine additional measures on the performance scores. Um, improvement activities, this is the kind of the new thing. You know, uh, quality reporting was there before, meaningful use was there before. There was, a there was a variation of cost report. But the improvement activities, it's a new thing. You have to attest that you completed up to four of these for a minimum of 90 days. And that's a reduction. Of, originally, they were doing it for the full 100, 365 days of the year. Now they reduced it down to three months. Uh, if you have groups with fewer than 15 participants or if you're in a rural or a HIPSA health professional shortage area, you can attest that you completed up to two of the activities for a minimum of 90 days. Um, if you're in a pa certified patient-centered patient medical home, a specialty practice or an APM designated as a medical home model, you automatically earn this and you don't have to do it because the, the thought process being that those models are already doing all these improvement activities, so there's no need to do it again. Um, if you're under certain APMs, under the APM scoring standards, such as a shared savings program, you'll automatically be scored based on what your program is doing, the requirements of participating in the APM. Um, for all, I'm just reading this straight because I don't want to get it wrong. For all current APMs under the APM scoring standard, the, this assigned score will be full credit. And for future APMs under the APM scoring standard, the assigned score will be at least half credit. So if you're in one of those models, it's sort of taken care of for you on some level. And that's generally what CMS is trying to do broadly. They're trying to push people into APMs because they think a lot of the care management, care coordination activities that they want to have done will happen under those umbrellas. And then if you're in any other kind of APM, you'll automatically earn half credit and you can report additional activities to increase your score. Um, of course, RPA, RPA has tools to help. There used to be something called PQRS, PQRS wizard. Now it's M, MP, MIPS wizard and it replaces the other wizard and there's additional information coming on this soon. And we also have a kidney quality improvement registry. You're going to be hearing a lot more about that in the next minute or two, but it is a CMS uh, approved quality clinical data, data registry. When CMS put out the, reg, the, the rule for this, the phrase QCDR showed up in the rule 365 times. So that's an indication that CMS wants these registries to be used. And presumably, it's a much easier way for you to report all your stuff. Plus, doctors participating in it can do their maintenance of certification activities through the um, uh, through, the, through the registry as well. So we think there's a lot of good reason to do it and there's a ton of information. There's going to be a booth here for the meeting where you can talk about it. Uh, $200 discount for RPA members. Report on six individual measures using both MIPS and custom RPA measures. The custom RPA measures is an important thing because this is the specialty picking out measures that are important to us, not the government telling, telling measures that are important to us. So, you know, that, that, that's a really good thing. And plus, it doesn't have to go through this brutal measures approval process that's out there um, under the National Quality Forum process. So that's a good thing as well. And, I'll, and as noted, it allows you to report on ACI and your improvement activity. So it's kind of one-stop shopping. I know when you see something that says $200 discount, well, what does it cost? Talk to the people at the registry. But in terms of the overall cost of doing all these things, it's probably a bargain, but I don't want to make this to be too much of a registry commercial. You'll be getting plenty of that, believe me. Um, oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, I should have read the next slide. Um, so it allows data to be used to satisfy professional and, uh, and MIPS activities. Uh, allows for, for reporting on all these things. And it also does have a secure online kind of a kind of a, a, a Facebook kind of community where you can, and it's all secure, but you can ask questions of other nephrologists and, that, and other practices about how to do the things. Um, 
It allows you to do uh, performance, uh, performance improvement activities. And it is the only nephrology specific QCDR. Um, and I'll bet it's going to be the only one. It's a real pain to get one of these up. So I don't know that any of the other nephrology groups are going to be getting into this, although I guess I shouldn't, uh, I guess I shouldn't be you know, predicting that. They might. Um, that's a screenshot of what the registry looks like, the registry website. Um, and now, uh, we always have this slide in here now for the fun part, what do all these requirements mean? Who will capture the data? Uh, how will we incorporate everything into our workflow? These are huge issues because you can say we'll report all this stuff, but actually how, what, what are the nuts and bolts of reporting these things in your practice? That's a much bigger deal to figure out. How do I monitor and track utilization of my QPP requirements? Some of these requirements don't apply to my specialty. Can I ignore them? This is a big deal. Nephrology is relatively fortunate in that we have measures that we can use. There was a kidney, kidney measure set that was out there before. You know, they're, like pathology and radiology, they don't know what the heck they're going to do with this because none of these measures apply to them because they're not seeing patients face to face. So nephrology is relatively fortunate in that regard. There's some specialties that are having a real problem with it. Um, you need to define an electronic copy of the medical record. record. Um, what, why is my vendor requiring me to pay for an upgrade? You know, this, of course, welcome, welcome to a capitalist society, but that's what they do. And my vendor certified, but my practice is on a different version, should I be concerned. One of the things they did when they did this pick your pace piece and allow people to kind of put their toe in the water slowly in terms of um, uh, uh, all of the quality reporting is that they realize the vendor community is not up to doing this right now. A lot of the vendors are having really problems satisfying all these things. So that's why they did pick your pace because they know that the vendor community, the, the, the health IT community isn't, a pla isn't in a place to be doing these things right now. So that's why they did that. Then uh, talk about macro a little bit more broadly. It provides a 5% base. Uh, Payment bonus for participation in advanced APMs, but the bar for the bonus is high and defined as taking on nominal risk. That means the physician practice has to take on financial risk to qualify as an uh, alternate payment model. The LDO stands for Large Dialysis Organization, so this David and Fresenius. Their ESCOs, people are probably familiar with the ESCOs, but if you're not, it stands for uh, ESRD Seamless Care Organization. These are kind of the renal ACOs. The LDO ESCOs were, were deemed to be advanced APM. So if you're in one of those and you satisfy the other criteria, you'll be eligible for the 5% bonus. And to be clear, the 5% bonus is on your total Medicare spend. It's just not your patients that are in the ESCO. So if you have a way of getting into an ESCO and you can qualify, you, know, you, you can qualify on the, on the other two uh, ways you have to qualify, you're going to get 5% on everything that on all of your Medicare billing, so that's pretty, pretty much of a big deal. We called for the APM bonus to be available to all ESCOs, not just the LDO ESCOs, and this is all about the nominal risk definition, but CMS chose not to do that. Um, this is kind of a little bit of summary of what I said before. You see the four categories there. The vast majority of participants will be in MIPS. There will be providers on both uh, plus, plus and minus sides of the equation. You know, I saw one of those where they have the four boxes and they have all the dots in the middle and everything, and you can see where all the outliers are. Virtually everybody's right around the middle. So if you're providing decent care and you're not spending a ton of money on it, you're going to do just fine in this. It's the people that are, uh, that are like low, qu low quality, high cost, they're going to get killed in MIPS. Whereas as long as you're not one of those folks, you, you won't get killed. And that's not to say that you might not take a small haircut, but you're not going to get, you know, you're not going to have some ma massive cut either. Um, another thing they were trying to do was to reduce the administrative burden for MIPS. Um, they had like all or nothing metrics in the old PQRS and meaningful use programs. They have less of that now. That's a good thing, but the complexity of the metrics is crazy. I, you know, I have to tell you, I've been reading Medicare regulations for 20 years. This was by far the most complex thing that any of us have ever read. So to their credit, and um, CMS kind of simplified things a bit. But as I noted, noted before, they said Q, they had the phrase QCDR in the uh, proposed rule on this 365 times, so the, the, the emphasis was unmistakable. In terms of high level concerns, cost attribution is going to be hard for nephrology because, of course, endocrinologists, cardiologists, all other kinds of specialties are seeing the patient. So where do you attribute who's providing the care and who gets the savings? Again, the EHR industry not, not ready for prime time, so the, uh, the implementation timeline was unrealistic. You know, it was interesting when this rule came out, they had a graph in there that actually said um, something like 12% of small and solo practices are going to be able to, to, to succeed in MIPS. 
that was probably the dumbest thing CMS could have ever done because you know the the trade press jumped on that and said you know new new macro rule to kill small small medical practice in America so they had to walk that back in a million ways and they've started all these programs to try and educate small and solo practices of how to succeed and then they did the that pick your pace thing which I'll be giving more detail about in a second but it was interesting how much they had to walk that back and we were also told there was an internal debate at CMS whether to even include that graph or not because they knew it was probably you know, incendiary, but they included it anyway, and they got what they deserved. Probably, um, they have a uh, they eliminated a specialty specific risk adjuster um, it, as as part of the proposed rule. We argued against that because we thought you know the nephrologists have the sickest patients, so if you get rid of that kind of uh, risk adjuster, that's a bad thing for the specialty. They chose not to do that. Again, the complexity and the volume of the complexity. It wasn't just that it was complicated; it was like every section of this thing was kind of 2,300 pages, and there was not a page in the whole rule that didn't have some layer of complexity with that. Although that said, I, I, I think the doomsday scenarios were overstated. And that really came to being in last September when Slavin announced that they were doing the Pick Your Pace program. I've already talked about this a bit. But the four available options are testing the quality payment program. That's the one measure in each of the three categories for the first year. And again, we're trying to get that extended for the second year. Participating in the QPP for part of the calendar year. And you could possibly get some kind of bonus for that. You can do it for the full year. You might get a bigger bonus if you do it for the full year. Or you can be in an AAPM, which if you, if you don't know whether you're in one yet now, you're probably not in one for the year. So the final rule did come out in February, substantially eased the process. I've already talked about pick your pace. They increased the volumes. So there's going to be more people who are going to be in the exempt categories and don't have to participate if you don't want to. They got rid of the cost component of it. And um, they were, uh, the, the advancing care information now has a 90-day reporting period in 27, 2018. and reduces the number of measures from 11 to 4 for this year and five for thereafter. So they really, in, in fairness to CMS, and I'm somebody who complains about CMS all the time, but they really did a lot of things to kind of make this more palatable, at least initially, until people figure out how to go about doing it. Um, now, we have the next series of slides, because we're talking about other incentive programs in Medicare, but these aren't necessarily physician ones. They're ones that are sort of based in the, in the dialysis facility, but we, did, we thought we should be talking about them, so we're going to do that. Clinical activity is only responsible for 60% of a nephrology practice income. The remainder is derived from medical director fees. And a lot of times, these are derived from how the facility does on their reporting scores. So that's why these, these few programs I'm going to talk about in a second are important. So there's a bunch of different ways that CMS oversees quality in, in ESRD programs. There's the dialysis facility compare program. This is that five-star thing. Highly controversial. Methodologically, CMS, they're really on, they're really on uh, not solid ground with, with the way they did this in terms of they have to have so many people in each category. So you could be very close to somebody who's uh, you could have a very close score to somebody and they might get in the next category higher and you might get in the next category lower because there's a required number of people to be in each one, which I can tell you the kidney community scream bloody and murder about, but CMS has not fixed that yet. Um, there's the quality, quality incentive program, the dialysis facility report. In terms of the report, it's got the report reports on all the things you would think that a dialysis facility would have to report on, um, patient characteristics, SMR, uh, hospitalizations, readmissions, infections, transplant, anemia management, all that stuff. That's all part of the report. Um, uh, ne the nephrology and the QIP, again, the incentive program is a pay for performance program for the dialysis facility. This was the first one in Medicare. So just like, you know, keeping with the theme that nephrology is special and unique, this was the first uh, pay, pay for performance program in Medicare. And dialysis facility compares a rating system to provide consumers with, deci uh, re with decision making. Both are relevant to nephrologists because, again, the QIP scores sort of depend on the ICD-10 coding. You've got to be accurate with your ICD-10 ICD coding or you could be leaving money on the table because you want to accurately demonstrate the complexity of your patients and you can't do that if you don't do um, accurate ICD-10. Undercoding may reduce case mix adjusters, which can reduce, uh, result in reduced facility reimbursement. And imprecise coding can cause inaccurate quality measure calculations and reporting. Um, if, if poor outcomes in this space can result in a 2% reduction in dialysis payment, and this will likely affect your medical director fees if, if, if that's how you're set up. Um, 
Talked about the dialysis facility compare five star program. Those are all the measures that they look right look at. Again, nothing terribly surprising there if you've been involved in dialysis facility reimbursement. You know, these are the things that people measure. Um, the quality incentive program, there are clinical measures, which is 25% of the total score. KTURV for hemo patients, P PDURV for, for PD patients, vascular access, NHSN bloodstream infections, hypercalcemia, standard readmissions ratio. And then there are reporting measures. 25% uh, of your total score, anemia management, uh, the, the uh, CAP scores and the mineral metabolism. And you can see the numbers at the bottom for how they broke those things out. So we talked a little bit earlier about the difference between um, outcomes reporting and, um, and process reporting, process measures. Process, again, just kind of measures, did you do something? Did you talk to your patient about immunizations? Whereas outcomes is like, how did that affect actually their clinical outcomes? And with that, I'll stop. Um, Happy to entertain questions about MACRA. Uh, it, uh, things are a lot clearer than they were before, but it's still kind of a mess. It's going to be interesting to see how this is going to play out in the new administration. The new secretary of HHS is not a huge van fan of value-based purchasing, is what the word is. He thinks it gets in the way of physician-patient uh, relationships. And he's absolutely not a fan of meaningful use and all the meaningful use of reporting uh, burdens that are out there. So there's some thought that some of that could get scaled back. But the macro law itself was a bipartisan, bicameral, both parties, both chambers of Congress. Huge support, passed with huge numbers, so I don't think they're going to be going back on MACRA. I think it's going to be out there. It's just maybe the implementation might not be as brutal as it seems like it is right now. So with that, I will stop. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, ma'am. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Neurology, there's OB, there's all yeah. kinds of them, <laughs> but nephrology's not in there. We've been arguing that. We've been trying to get yeah. Have. We've been trying to get ours in there, but they didn't do that on the first cut. So uh -huh. um, we're very well aware of that. Now, of course, you could also say, well, that's going to put people into our registry, which we would love, but we don't want to be that that to be the hammer out there. We're trying to get CMS to change that, but so far, no success. But no, we noticed. <laughs> I, well, I'm sure you noticed. I just wondered where if there's even hope that at some point. No, no, I think there is. I mean, the, the fact that it was out there before, kind of, you know that there are Isn't people at CMS point? who get this. Yeah, you know that there are people at CMS that get this. We actually had a very productive meeting with um, people about all of this stuff, the kind of the quality measurement people at CMS uh, and ESRD specific folks in October. And Dr. Weinstein, who's given a lot of our MIPS talks over the years, was there. And you could see the light bulbs going on for the people on the other side of the table. They know they've got reporting problems. They know that nephrology and kidney disease is really unique in its own thing. You know, they're trying to deal with, you know, yeah. the, you know family practice and general exactly. internal medicine. So to try and get them to focus on the specific part, you know, we're doing our best to get them to realize they've got some holes that they need to fill. And we're in the process of doing that. We've met, again, met with them again. Wait. One more question about the 15 or less um, uh, participants or providers in a practice. So if you have less than 15 providers, that means doctors, nurse practitioners, PAs or anything, you can really do just two quality issues instead of the four? Yes. And it, you don't have to be a rural community. As long as you have less than 15, you can do it too. It, well, if you're in a rural community or if you have less or than 15. Or if you have yeah, less it than is 15, definitely an or. not and. No, 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 it's definitely an or. Okay, thank yep. you. You're welcome. Others? Okay, we'll proceed. And there's this option for physicians to take part in a class online. When you go and follow those links, when you get in, nephrology is missing there too. So I was shocked, as politically active as RPA is, to see that. 
Well, you know, these things come out, it, and I don't want to make the excuse of the rulemaking process move slowly, but the rulemaking process moves slowly. You know, the final rule came out in uh, whenever that was, in October of last year. We were in there with them after that. We pointed all these things out to them. It will probably be the next rulemaking cycle, cycle for MACRA, which is probably could be expected within the next six weeks or so, two months. And we'll see if what we, what we bore bear fruit, what we took to them bore fruit. But we did bring all these issues up with them. So, OK. To add those comments, I have a favorite phrase. You're using logic and CMS in the same sentence. <laughs> that is part of the issue, and CMS is a major bureaucracy, and that bureaucracy changing their things is worse than trying to, to turn an air, aircraft carrier on a dime. It takes its own time. so. We would all like for things to go quicker, but they don't. How many of you have been audited? Hmm, fewer than I thought. There is all kinds of audits out there. There are audits that are conducted by the Office of the Inspector General. There are recovery audit contractors. There are the CERT comprehensive error rate testing, which applies to me, a Medicare administrative contractor, which also is me, uh, there are Medicaid integrity contractors, and there are the ZPEX, or Zone Program Integrity Contractors. Any and all of these individuals can do an audit. And any and all of these individuals have specific reasons for doing their audits. The Inspector General has the integrity of the entire HHS system as part of their issue, and they're looking, trying to find er areas of detect fraud and abuse and how to avoid it and correct it. Again, most of their resources actually are directed towards Medicare and Medicaid. So even though they have all of HHS, their main concentration, also the main part of the budget, goes to those two entities. Recovery Guard audit contractors are hired by CMS and their purpose is to basically look for improper payments. Uh, they are paid on a contingency basis uh, which basically means the more they recover the more they get paid. So their incentive is to find things. Uh, they have several types of audits. There's the automated audit where they just sort of look at something and pull the records uh, out of the Medicare claims database and look for exceptions, outliers, et cetera. Then they have a semi-automated where they might pick you up, look at it, and say, OK, fine, and may ask you for one or two records to look at something. And then they have the complex audits where you get the request for 100 records. And they will basically calculate and figure out what your error rate is, how much you owe them, et cetera, so that that's the way they function. There are several regions. Uh, basically region C, A, B, and D. And the contractors actually have just changed for all of these regions so that uh, they, there may be some new ones so they'll be ramping up very shortly. Uh, this slide is out of date already. Uh, we'll have to change that because like they, they just redid the contracts effective the 1st of April. So that all of these will be changing almost immediately, and we're in the process of trying to switch over. It will be the same, the same players, but just different. Uh, no, actually, there's some. Connolly is no longer doing it at all. Really? Yeah. Oh, good riddance. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, and uh, let's see. Uh, Rock Hib is also out of it. I don't know. I think Performance Track is still involved, but they just they basically completely rebid the contracts. Uh, comprehensive error rate testing, uh, this is where they look at your Medicare and determine what kind of claims errors they have. This is purely a contractual basis. 
but the problem is is that renewals of MAC contracts basically have a large component to what your cert rate is. So that they're going to make sure that they're going to pay their claims properly. And in paying their claims properly, most cert errors are overpayment or inappropriate payments. So that's why they sometimes concentrate on making sure that, that every dot, every I and T, et cetera, has been covered. Administrative administrative contract, that's me. Uh, we do audit activities. We look at prepayment and postpayment. Most of these are identified as uh, from outliers doing our own analysis. We will usually start with an analysis looking at a, an issue where we think there may be a problem. If we see outliers, we will go look at those in a postpayment format. And if they do not uh, fix themselves, then we may look them at a prepayment format. Prepayments is sort of the last issue. As I said, it can go for a single provider, a specific code, or a code set, or if we just feel like it. The integrity contractor, basically they review and, and look at mainly Medicaid, but they also do a Medicare occasion uh, to look for high risk and potential vulnerabilities. Since Medicaid is run by the states, uh, this is a federal oversight of the Medicaid program, if you will. There are some situations where you've got dual eligibles that the integrity contractor will get, get involved with. A lot of dialysis patients are indeed dual eligibles. They have both Medicare and Medicaid. So that those, those are how you may be involved with those. ZPIX, uh, basically, if I find something, or if we find something in a Medicare contractor that looks like either on an initial claim or a series of claims or through an audit that looks like there may be something more than just error or things and we think there may be true fraud or waste or abuse, then we have to make a referral to them. Uh, again, it's administrative action which may include uh, removal of privileges or if they are, are even more concerned, uh, they work closely with the FBI. Target areas. This is the OIG work plan for 2017. It's published every year, usually in November. But really, the, the book comes out, what, March? Yeah. February, March time frame. It just came out. Basically, this basically determines what the strategy plans for the OIG are. Our contractor strategy plans, which are similar, are not yet complete. Uh, there is no specific renal related issues in the 2017 OIG. I can tell you that for, uh, from personal knowledge that is not the case for the contractors. There were several elements in the rules that, caused the, that call the contractors to task concerning uh, various forms of dialysis payment and they've made it clear that they want us to be looking at it, so that's why they're being included in the contract strategy. It, it is interesting that the OIG didn't have it in their work plan for this year because I, I think as long as I've been looking at the OIG work plan, there's been something about like ambulance use and dialysis or ESAs or you know dialysis, the, the PPS billings. So it was fairly remarkable that it wasn't in the OIG's work plan for this year, but of course, no good deed goes unpunished, so the contractors are <laughs> looking at it. <laughs> Also, the ambulance issue has been pretty much taken care of uh, the, with the prior approval pilots that seem to, be, seem to be being effective. They're seeing a major reduction in the use of those, so I suspect that that program will go nationally. I don't know that for a fact. I'm just, I'm reading tea leaves. Rack targets, place of service errors, incorrect billing of ESAs, correct billing of E&Ms. Uh, medical necessity, uh, this has tran tran percontinuous transluminal angioplasties. They're also looking at medical necessity for any other type of visit as well. And incorrect billing of the ESRD codes. The audit, this says there's an 800,000 claim backload. That number has been reduced substantially. Medicare has had three cycles in the last year of uh, proposals for settlements with the various hospitals, providers, et cetera so that those numbers have dropping off regularly. Um, 
most of these rack audit claims ended up in the ALJs, and the ALJs are very backed up even still. There was one point where the racks had pu pulled so many claims that they th didn't they have something like a 15-year back? It would have taken them 15 years to get through all of the claims that they had already pulled. So the rack system kind of got suspended about two or three years ago, and they weren't allowed to pull claims anymore. You know, the racks are kind of bounty hunters. So you know, of course they're going to pull claims because they want to maximize how much money they can make in the process. But they pulled so many, and they had this, you know, decades-long backlog that, or de could be decades-long backlog that, they were suspended and uh, told that they couldn't pull. I'm getting that all right, aren't I, Lee? Pretty much, yeah. So I think they're slowly putting their toes back in the water because they're resolving a bunch of the outstanding issues that they had. Um, again, new rat contracts limit uh, to what they can look back to six months. It used to be three years. And their, re and their uh, recoupments were based on three years, not six months. So there were some major bills that came out because of it. Also, it's no longer the first level of review. That's been referred to the QIOs. So that the QIOs are actually supposedly there to help you and educate you. Uh, I'm from the government. I'm here to help you. But uh, they, they, are, they have a lesser incentive to charge you for errors rather than to help you fix errors. And, and for what it's worth, the QIOs, that stands for Quality Improvement Organizations, they've been kind of more assertive as a, as a body to begin with. I think they took over a few of the ESRD network contracts, and in the ESRD world, that was a fairly controversial thing because I think that a lot of the networks thought they were doing everything just fine. They didn't need fairly to Fairly controversial. Uh, I'm not <laughs> being politically correct there, Dr. Garrett. Um, but it was fairly controversial in the ESRD world because I think the networks thought they were doing just fine, but these things got contracted out. The, some of the QIOs bid, bid on some of them, and some of them got awarded the contract. And there's continued emphasis in hospital claims. Uh, observation admissions are, are a primary part, part of that. How do you avoid audits, and how do you protect yourself in audits? Uh, basically, one, you need to be doing internal audits. You need to look at yourself, and you need to be very careful how you look at yourself. One of the easiest things to do is look at what your code distribution is. If you have a general code distribution that pretty much meets these numbers, these are from 2014. Uh, the 2015 numbers are supposedly out. I mean, the 2013 numbers. The 2015 numbers are supposedly out, but I've not been able to find them. But that gives a... a uh, distribution of how nephrologists, because this is specific to nephrology, claims on a nationwide basis how they look at how their claims. If you notice, most of the claims, 54 percent 04, 59% 214, 54% 223. Remember I said our patients are complicated and our claims nationwide reflect that. If you are within those environments, you're probably pretty good in terms of what you, how you're coding and how you're billing. But if you have a provider that you identify that for some reason he's concerned about overcoding and is billing everything at a, at a lower level, like a 213 for instance, you need, might need to, to look at him and talk to him and conference him. So you need to have an analysis of how you're coding and how your providers are actually coding their charts. And then if you ha see a difference or you see a problem, Go look at the charts and see what they really should be doing. We actually did this for, this is 2015. Medicare's 2015 are out too, and I can't find them. But if you'll notice, the 2015 data that we got from uh, the RPA did shows similar numbers. Notice that the higher level codes, especially the 215, are not that common. As a rule of thumb, and this is sort of what I tell people, so this is my opinion. The bill on 215, you have to think the patient may need to be admitted. That's sort of a good rule of thumb. If that patient's sick enough that you're actually thinking about admitting them, that's probably a 215 visit. Which is a reasonable rule of thumb that I found. There is a benchmarking surveys that are available, and it's based on 2015 data. 
They identify the problem areas. You can identify and apply best practices. And then decide what kind of changes you make, comparing yourself to the national averages. Because that's how you're judged. It's how you compare with the national and or regional averages. And then when you do that, you see that you have a problem, you see that you're an outlier, then you need to put together a plan of action. This is just the cover, if you will. When you're doing that, you're looking at your own vulnerabilities. Uh, you develop a plan on how you're doing a regular documentation review. This needs to be an ongoing, continual process. So that you just don't say, well, we did it last year, we can look at it another three years. No, you need to be continually looking at it in some structured, organized format. You need to stick with it, do it, and then your providers need to get feedback if you see a problem or you see an issue. And you also get outside help. Uh, it is a good idea, not absolutely required by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a good idea to have some sort of outside auditor look at you every three to five years. Have them do an objective review of how you're doing. A lot of times, well, we do it that way, that's the way we do it, becomes sort of the structure of the, of the review, and you miss things. So to have someone come from the outside and do a formal review and look at you and give you feedback and compare you to these benchmark numbers or their national numbers or whatever gives you a good idea of what you're doing. Also, if you undergo a primary audit, the fact that you have this type of program and this type of structured program is a primary defense. In other words, we've been doing this for the last five years. We've been looking at it. We found this. We've corrected that. We found that. The outside orders found this. We corrected it. Yeah, you found these errors on these charts that you pulled. It's a random chart pull. But we can document that we've been addressing these issues and dealing with them. That's a primary defense when you're in an audit. So, Lee, just the fact that you're internally looking for stuff is, is, is a great defense? Absolutely. And do you find practices that don't have any of these? Okay, never mind. There are usual pitfalls that you need to be aware of and look for. Legibility. Uh, signature scrawls. Make sure you have a signature document so that you can basically say, yeah, that's his signature. Use of acronyms. Acronyms become very localized at times and are usually not acceptable coding. You have to be careful. There are acceptable coding acronyms Medicare publishes. I talked about signatures. And we mentioned cloning. I'm going to keep mentioning cloning because that is, a, that is a, something that auditors look at, look for, and will punish. I just want to point out that at the RUC meetings, if anybody's phone rings, they're buying drinks for everybody in the room. So, um, just kidding. <laughs> and I like expensive single malt scotches. So. <laughs> also, continue monitoring your practice. You need to also be looking at your denials. Why are they being denied? I'm hearing a lot of questions about denial, so obviously people are doing it. But you need to know why they're being denied. And if you're being denied and you question that denial, uh, you can do an appeal, obviously, but if that gets appealed, there are structures within the, within the MAX that if you're getting a denial that you don't understand, they can help you. Uh, there's uh, what's called the POE section, the provider education sections. That's their job. And they'll come to me or, or someone like me and say, okay, and then we will send out, I will have a claim, an a claim analyzed. And I can tell you specifically why it was denied. And it may mean not what you think. A lot of times there are technical denials that uh, do not basically relate to what you said. It's just how it was submitted. So that you need to basically keep a very close track on it and also understand exactly why they're being denied. Because if you understand that, then you won't repeat the error. Again you, again, you need to benchmark and know where you are and how you are. Staff education is something that you need to do on a regular basis. Feedbacks, uh, basically your coders can basically sit down with your docs and say, okay, 
this is how we want you to code it. This is how you want, want you to describe it. I mean, this is how you want you to document it. I said code it. This is how you want you to document it. And that way you can get some consistency within your practice. The more consistent you are inter-provider, the better you're going to look to an auditor. I'm sorry, wrong way. I've, I've said this to somebody. It is the physician's signature on the bottom of the 1500. They're the person responsible. If you as a coder or whomever have an issue with how you think it's being done or coded, you need to clear it with your doc. I had that question this morning. It's the doc's signature on the bottom of the form. He is the person ultimately responsible. He is the one that has the potential for going to jail if there is a major problem. Otherwise, paying fines, losing Medicare privileges, whatever. Jail being the worst possibility. Additionally, however, if you know within your practice that they're, sub, they're purposely submitting fraudulent claims and you're, at, you're aware of it, you have the responsibility to report it. Otherwise, you're considered equally liable. That's a word to the coders. If you get an audit, somebody walks in, shows their ID and say, we. We're from here, we're the government here to help you. We want to see your records. You need to have a dedicated person within your office that knows how to deal with it, and preferably a backup. But you need to make sure that there is one person who is fully versed in how to approach these pro processes. Like I said, if you have an ongoing audit process, you need to document that you have that process. Any and all activities, QA meetings, audits, whatever, internal audits, those need to be documented and put in a record so that you can plop it in front of the auditor. Like I said, it's a primary defense. You need to know what the rules or engagement are, what that auditor can ask for, what they can't ask for, who they can talk to and who they can't talk to, and in cer certain circumstances, what are your rights in terms of legal representation? That depends on the level of the audit. Some of these audits, basically, you might need to have a lawyer present. Again, if they ask for stuff, get it, and get it in a hurry. They're human, and if they have to sit there and wait for a couple of days to get the documentation, they're not going to be happy. And if they're not happy, that, ten that tends to affect how they will look at your audit in terms of giving you any leeway whatsoever and always be prepared for your appeal. With the RACs, the original thing was, you know, appeal all your RAC claims because most of them were being overturned on appeal. Recently, those numbers have dropped dramatically and the ALJ, Administrative Law Judge determinations, are usually in favor of the contractor, not, not, the, not the, the person that's basically had been, been audited. But there's been a lot of lot of weeding through those, et cetera, so that's probably changed. And, and I would urge folks with any one of these kinds of audits, if something doesn't smell right to you, give us a call. Uh, we heard of a situation in the last, say, six weeks or so of a ZPIC auditor, and I'm going to get the specifics of this wrong, but a ZPIC auditor was catching interventional nephrologists up in an effort to, um, I guess they were... Hello. That's unfortunate. Did somebody lean <laughs> nap time, post lunch? Um, did somebody lean against the wall or something there? Um, anyway, they caught interventional nephrologists. Lee, do you remember what they were doing? Was it vascular embolism? Yeah. They were doing vascular embolism, but for the nephr interventional nephrologists doing it, they were coding appropriately, but they were getting caught up in, I guess, like phlebotomists and um, a peripheral. Uh, the, the people that do vein surgeries. Yeah. On legs. Yeah, yeah. They were getting. It was. It was an audit effort to catch up, catch all those folks who were using the code inappropriately. 
but nephrologists who were using the code inappropriately got caught up in it. We have appealed it, and we like to, we have a pretty good feeling about the fact that we think this is going to get overturned because it's pretty clear in CPT that the, that the auditor just didn't know what they were doing. Um, so we think they're getting it fixed, but I only bring that up as to say, if you think you're getting audited and it's something that you know is right, give us a call and we can, we can help weigh in on it for you. Are there any questions? I can't an I cannot answer that question. Sorry. Rob, this might be more for you. When you did the benchmarking survey, is there a reason why you didn't benchmark subsequent hospital visits? Because you only did initials. Yes, I have a question. For the Medicare audits, do they do their scanning to identify outliers at the TIN level or at the NPI level? Both. Both? Mm -hmm. And, and ICD-9, IC, I mean ICD-10, CPT. We can do any and all of them. Okay, we can move on. Now we're going to talk about some things that are fairly unique, but also involve nephrology. Uh, I'm going to start with this. Is I, I admit Chet's set of slides. So, so I'm winging it. So if if, if I can't answer your question, or if I if I'm done saying something wrong, correct me, or I will find an answer for you. Hospice. The care of support who are terminally ill. Also, uh, to this point, there is some evidence that palliative care may start being included in the benefit, but that's not there. For to get hospice benefit from Medicare, the patient must meet all of the situ these situations. They must be in Part A. Uh, they have a doctor, their own personal doctor, and the medical director of hospice certify that they are terminally ill and supposedly have six to six months or less to live. The patient must sign a statement that they are choosing hospice care. And that basically removes them from the eligibility for any other Medicare benefits. With one exception, ESRD. They can continue receiving their ESRD benefits even though they're in hospice as long as their reason for being in hospice is not ESRD. If they have myeloma and they're dying from their myeloma, they're on dialysis for their myeloma, they can continue their dialysis. And Medicare must be from a hospice approved Medicare program. Hospice pays for everything. Uh, they can use hospice for health care not related to the terminal condition and with that the GV modifier is used to bill Medicare by a physician not involved with hospice. That does not apply to your MCP. The GW. No, there's another one. Okay. There's the GV and the GW. Both of them have their specific uses. They're both, both are there. GW uh, is that are unrelated to the terminal condition. GV physician not employed. Okay? So they are, they are separate modifiers with separate definitions. We actually discussed this in preparing the slides the other day. <laughs> yeah, they, that one. Well, I was the one that Someone answered. Someone asked us if it was a misprint. We said, hey, no. He knew. Hey, no. Okay. Uh, physicians providing the hospice for the, other than attending must have a contract with the hospice. The GW modifier is used for care that's not related to the terminal condition. The bill for the vision services in the hospitalization can be used with care plan oversight codes 99377 and 99388. 
and the hospice can be used at ESRD. Yeah, a couple of years ago they did rulemaking in hospice that was really confusing that made it seem like they were muddying the waters and we were thinking that maybe you, the two benefits wouldn't be able to be used at the same time. So us and a number of other groups in the kidney community got up and said, do you got to make this clear? And God bless them in their final rule, they had a statement saying, you yeah, know, specifically does not saying apply. what we wanted them to say. It does not apply. Yeah. Apheresis. How many of you guys do apheresis? Good. Nephrologists will do this commonly. Uh, pathologists used to do it. Pathologists didn't like it. Oncologists still do it, but they do it primarily for their stem cell, platelets, et cetera, harvesting. Uh, nephrologists do the plasmapheresis for all the other reasons that are available. These are the codes, 96514 and 96516. Three, 365. Huh? Three, I'm sorry, 96514. 365. Three, three, Why am I saying nine? Sorry. <laughs> 365.4, it's, it's been a long day. <laughs> okay, and then basically you uh, do this, okay? The 36515 has been combined with the 36516, 36, yeah, 36516 to one code. That was effective. The CPT manual still has both codes. Yeah, but that code will be gone in 2018. Right. So that you should be billing the 36516. Okay? These are the things we usually don't do. I talked about the oncologist, leukophoresis, red cells, and platelets, and also stem cell harvesting. There is a thing out there called aquaphoresis that there is a company that is trying to sell this to Cardiologists primarily, where they can do uh, fluid removal using an extracorporeal technique within their offices. One, there's no specific code, and we basically recommend that you instead use 90999 for ultrafiltration. Aquaphoresis is a brand name. It's like yeah, saying Kleenex. Yeah. Yes. You know, it's rather than okay. tissue. So. And if you're doing it for lipids, I'd use 36516. Wave form analysis, um, this was added to the CPT codes in 2016. Uh, RPA suggested it, RPA put it in, it worked, came through, uh, and the code is 93050. However, it is a non-covered code by a lot of people. About 50%, about, uh, yeah. about half of the countries carry, your carriers representing half the country are paying for it. Um, I know Noridian in the West, First Coast Options for Florida and uh, Novitas, which is, I think it's Novitas, Novitas for Texas, the Southwest, um, Middle Atlantic states, they're not paying for it yet. We're still You're trying to help. You're talking about you missed one. What I miss? Palmetto. Palmetto. Oh, well, that's new. <laughs> Great. If only we knew somebody who worked for Palmetto. Um, but anyway, uh, we're we're trying to fight the fight. I mean, we a lot of the arguments that the carriers, in my mind, Lee probably disagree with this, but a lot of the arguments that the carriers are putting out there, we perceived were resolved at the CPT and Ruck in terms of is it a real service? Is it a distinguishable service? Um, you know, you know we, we limited this to a very small census of patients for whom it would be applicable. And our argument is for those patients, it should be applicable and should be payable by the carriers. And that's why CPT, it went through CPT and RUT and got valued the way it did and why CMS allowed those RVUs to be in the fee schedule. But these other carriers are saying it's not medically necessary. It's just part of a regular. Well, medical you know. necessity in this environment means basically... How does it affect your treatment of the patient and does it change your treatment of the patient versus other methods? That's the issue that comes up. I'm not, I'm not jumping on one side of the fence or other on that. I can't. Yeah, I mean, but, but I, we were, and is it resistant hypertension? Is that the term? That, that was the term that, was, that this service should be used for. So we would say resistant hypertension patients, this is highly predictive of bad stuff farther down the road and that's why it should be allowed. It's really amazing technology if you've never seen what it does. 
Telehealth and telemedicine, um, I am learning this, but I am not the expert that Chad is, so I apologize up front. Telehealth is the use of medical information exchanged from one site to another via electronic communications to improve the patient. Uh, close a variety of multiple applications, two-way communications, smartphones, etc. There are also a thing called telehealth, and they're used interchangeably with telemedicine, and there are some distinct differences between the two. Telehealth is a broader term uh, that uses any uh, remote activity to improve health, but does not necessarily involve a clinical service. Telemedicine has a clinical service. Um, video conferencing, remote monitoring, online medical evaluations, etc. cetera. Uh, telehealth is the capability of developing medical services to improve the condition of instant areas. Telemedicine is a subset of telehealth by the delivery of clinical services. So that's the difference and the thing. In terms of telemedicine, some states require that physicians delivering care via telemedicine be licensed in the state where the care is being delivered. This frequently applies to radiologists, uh, but also uh, I have seen other examples that are growing where there is consultant services that are, are basically being conducted. Uh, they have the same, same standard of care for face-to-face -face visits, depending on what they bill for that. And they're expected to also uh, adhere to the current standards of practice improvement and monitoring of their outcomes. Macro. There are telephone services, internet services, interprofessional telephone and internet consultations, which you can bill for, and they're synchronous and asynchronous. Telephone services initiated by an established patient and the, uh, to a qualified or other health care professional. Uh, it has to be, if there's been service within the last 27 days, call leads to the patient being seen within 24 hours or is within the, the, the global period post-operatively. And then you, you have the various time codes based on this. If you're doing telemedicine and this is a time code, you need to have start and stop times. Online services uh, can be non-face-to-face, -face, uh, patient using internet resources and the patients to an online inquiry. Response must be timely. Uh, permanent storage of the encounter, uh, only once in a seven-day period. And multiple patient physicians can be involved. Uh, if there's been a previous service in seven days, or if it's in the global period for surgery, you can't use it. It can encompass the entire communication, and the 99444 is the code to be used. You also can use a code for a consultation with another physician. Uh, say you call up uh, your, atten your old attending at, at the medical university or whatever and get a consult. Uh, that is no need for a face-to-face -face contact with a physician for you to get advice. Same situation as if you were billing counseling codes in a private visit, in an office visit, you can do this here as well. Telemation consults that need to be new, uh, have maybe established a new, a pro new problem, and if they've been seen the last 14 days, and then you have, if you have an, a, a, a face-to-face -face visit planned in the next 14 days, or you arrange it as part of that call. Uh, again, these are the codes, time codes, and you need time and place. You need, you need the billing times, I'm sorry. Originating site is an issue. Uh, Medicare published a new uh, place of service called the POS2 for telemedicine. And that's perfectly appropriate to use. However, they did not change the originating site requirements. So that originating site, which has to be the location that the cone call is coming from, has to still meet these criteria. It has to be outside of a metropolitan area, is part of a rural health shortage area, 
or uh, can be as part, oh, here it is, okay. Fellow Requalified Health Center, uh, some renal dialysis centers, that's not been well defined in my mind, some skilled nursing facilities. Again, no independent dialysis facilities or patient homes can be considered as originating sites, which makes it difficult for us to do telemedicine. And this is something that we're trying hard, and we're lobbying hard to get fixed. We're trying to have the list of originating sites be modified to include the uh, dialysis facility and the patient's home. Um, last year, the Senate Finance had a, a, a work group on chronic care, and they added uh, the patient's home just for ESRD home visits, not for any other, nowhere else in Medicare. Um, to this, I think it's kind of their way of dipping their toe in the water to see if they can figure out using the patient's home as an originating site for telemedicine more broadly. Um, that provision got added to the new version of what will be the Connect bill, which is the telehealth bill that Congress is going to be considering, you know, hopefully introduce within the next month or so. If there were to be a Medicare package later in the year, I would suspect that these telehealth provisions are going to get in there. So if, 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 if all that were to happen, this time next year, the patient's home for, e for ESRD home visits and the dialysis facility for all ESRD care would be added to the list of originating sites and you'd be able to use all these codes. You know, for the last five years, CMS would say, well, we're going to add the MCP to the list of approved telehealth services, and we're going to add the home visits to the list of telehealth services, and the inpatient dialysis, like, yeah, but it doesn't do any good because none of the originating sites work out, which we point out to them every year in our comments. But if they fix the originating sites, which are legislatively mandated, it's not something CMS can fix administratively. But if they did fix it, then all these, all these services would open up to nephrology practices, and that's what we're lobbying for right now. Also, there are, and actually they're under demonstration projects now, a lot of the home health physician groups where they will go and visit their patients in the home and take care of those patients in the home they're also lobbying hard for telehealth privileges. Yeah, it, it, getting added to the list of originating sites is a cottage industry within like Medicare policy in DC because everybody wants to be added to the list of originating sites. So it's something that everyone's going for. We think we have a more solid case than a lot of uh, other specialties. Okay, uh, there is a GT95 modifier for Medicare claims where a distant site practitioner provides real-time services to a beneficiary who is present in an originating site when furnishing telehealth services. Uh, you are doing ESRD related services, uh, you need to certify also that you've seen the patient at least once a month with a hands-on visit. Whether the MCP visits can be included in that or not, I don't know. Do you? Well, they're, they're on the approved list. It all comes yeah. down to the originating sites though. So, so if they're in a proper originating site, and you, you can do an MCV visit over, I mean, you're answering yeah, yeah, actually, to be clear about this, say you have an MCP patient and they were willing, and say they're 100 miles away in a rural area and they want to drive to a community health center near them and you've got telehealth wherever you are, you could do MCP visits that way today. You could deliver the MCP that way, but it sort of defeats the purpose for the, neither the dialysis facility nor the patient's home to be among the list of originating sites. So, if you, Lee, if you want to go back to that list of the originating sites that were out there, if you get the patient to go to one of these places, you could do the MCP now. But again, in our mind, it sort of defeats the purpose because you're making the patient travel anyway. So the whole idea of telemedicine is to be able to not make the patient travel. And then these are the codes that can be used for telehealth consultations, inpatient health teleconsultations, office visits, subsequent hospital care visits, uh, group kidney disease education services can also be done by a telehealth. Uh, you can uh, set that up in some way. And then we've talked about that. Here's the very problem, is that it's very difficult to do any sort of high level codes using current telemedicine equipment. And in these visits, the current E&M standards for that level of visit still apply. And there are certain elements of a complex physical examination 
that are very difficult to do over a telephone, telemedicine connection. So that is probably part of the problem. And, and uh, to be clear, we got the term synchronous and asynchronous in there. That just refers to synchronous as real time, like a face to face. You're doing Skype or doing something like that. Whereas as this says, uh, asynchronous is the store and forward where data or an image or whatever gets put, say, in some place where the provider can access it later and take a look at it. It's not real time. That's the difference, real time versus yeah. not real time. Radiology is a classic example of the asynchronous. Uh, Again, this gets into what Rob was saying earlier. CPT codes have been approved, but they have to go to the end, they have to go to an originating site. We're working on that. Transitional care management, patient-based uh, -based visits, initial patient contact, and medication risk reconciliations within specified time frame. First face-to-face -face visit is not reported separately. Addi additional E&M services after that may be reported separately. Again, these must occur, uh, cannot be billed as part of the MCP. A lot of the stuff that is occurring in these visits are MCP related. And it most likely would be used if you're doing an CKD patient or an AKI patient. There is also a level of conflict and this is a first come first serve code so that the primary care docs may, may try to beat you to it. Yeah, but Medicare only pay one per month per patient, so yeah. it's kind of if the endocrinologist or, or That's whoever That's what I mean by first come, first yeah. serve. <coughs> Chronic care management, uh, again, under the director of physician. Again, it cannot be billed with the MCP. Uh, it can be applied to your CKD patients for management coordination, et cetera. Usually these for, would be for ESRD patients that are getting prepared for dialysis. Uh, again, they have to be home, domiciliary, or assisted living. In other words, you're going to see somebody in assisted living trying to do it, have at least two chronic conditions, um, and expected that the patient is at significant risk of death. Dialysis is the basic definition of that. Have to have an EHR, 24 hours, 24 seven access to care management services, which becomes difficult for some nephrology practices. Uh, co continuity with a de designated member of the care team and a systematic assessment of health needs. From what I am understanding, a lot of, a lot of most nephrology practices are not using these codes. Are you? Yeah, that's great, I agree. That's what I hear. Again, there also has to be informed consent, and the billing practitioner must initiate using a F uh, FTF's visit, which is billed separately. And my understanding, face -face uh, sorry, and my understanding about the nephrology practices not doing it is it's kind of one of those juice isn't worth the squeeze kind of deals. You know, the, all of the things you have to do to do it in a compliant way isn't w worth whatever CMS, is it like 40 bucks a month that they're paying for this or something? So it's kind of not worth it's not worth the money that they're paying to go through all the song and dance to provide the service. And again, you can't do these on ESRD patients anyway. Yeah. Now, I do know that ESCOs with some of their CKD care are doing it. And this says that ACOs can also do it. But I know that ESCOs, some of the ESCOs are doing it. And again, may separately bill e &M or procedure codes, but if you don't count them toward that time. And then there's chron chron complex chronic care management. These are the codes. Again, they're basically add-on codes, timed codes, so you need always have to put the time down. That came in the 2015. Again, time code, non-face-to-face -face care management can also be billed. Not billed at a lot, office-based redress was 40 bucks. Uh, you do have incident two requirements that are relaxed in terms of physician presence primarily. You do have to have a care plan and again, it cannot be billed. All of these cannot be billed with your MCP. It can be furnished by basically anybody as long as it's within their scope of practice. And uh, they are bundled under the uh, p uh, patient fee schedule. Advanced care planning. Uh, MCP patients are not excluded. This is the only one where they're not. 
Some are paying and some are not. Uh, billable conjunction with E&M services and incident two does apply. There is a kicker that we've, had, we've argued amongst ourselves in that if you look at the actual rule, advanced care planning is supposedly occurring within the preventative care visit in a family practice office. ESRD is not there, so that it, they are being denied under that process in some places. Did we ever figure out? Go. It, no, it, it, it's definitely being denied in some places, definitely being paid in others. You know, with the transitional care management, and the chronic care management, when our experts looked at it, they kind of felt like those services are captured by the MCP bundle, so they were appropriately not included in the TCM or CCM codes. What happens in advanced care planning is not included, it, not by definition included in the MCP, so we thought that that was right. We applauded CMS for this de decision. They did the right thing. Um, now, again, we do know some, I know like the, pay, the payers in the uh, Northeast are paying for this. Um, I guess, I haven't heard of it being denied, but uh, is Palmetto denying it, do you know, or? Has not come up. Hasn't come up. So. Uh, from what we understand, this should be paid for. So if you file claims for this and it gets denied, we'd be curious to hear about that and figure out why, because it doesn't, to my mind, it doesn't make sense. Lee and I have a slight difference of opinion on this, but that's... No, uh, I think it makes sense. In fact, uh, some of the newer metrics for dialysis unit includes acute, uh, acute care planning. Uh, so that once those, those metrics come into effect, I think it would probably be included in the part of the MCP at that point. Well, it's silly for them not to pay for this. For oh, absolutely. I, mean, I look at these things, I know you're, you're lined with logic and CMS, but, you know, who, <laughs> I think you should be doing advanced care planning on ESRD patients. It makes a lot of sense. Save CMS money and, you know, a million other good policy reasons to do it, but whatever. Acute kidney injury. This is a big win. 2012, CMS basically looked at the statute, and because they were seeing a large number of people admitted to ESRD and then shown as recovery, they started questioning it. They'd been questioning it for the previous 10 years, but never really found out why. And then they figured out this was AKI and came out with a statement that basically said that uh, Medicare facilities could not do AKI patients. With that, uh, so they, the questions had to be changed, and the issue was somewhat variable. Uh, some of the CON states had issues. In fact, there was a question earlier today that sounded like it was a CON issue. I, I, I got to interrupt here for a second. Just yeah. when that 2012 policy came out, we screamed bloody murder. The entire community came together and said, this is nuts. And I talked to this bureaucrat at CMS who, uh, they were like, oh, the Office of General Counsel loves this policy because they had sort of been not compliant with their own rules for the previous 20 years, allowing the kind of uh, informal arrangements to be made where these claims could get paid. So they, the lawyers were super happy about this because it meant that they were now in compliance. You know, the whole community was like, yeah, well, doctors and patients hate it because the care is horrible. And, you know, it means that AKI patient has to drive past 15 dialysis facilities to go to the University of Virginia, you know, medical center so they can do it in a hospital setting. So, anyway, it was just kind of funny how this all played out. Yeah, yeah this is statutory compliance, so that's sort of, there, there's no way CMS can get around it when they find something like this. However, 2016. Uh, in the uh, trade bill that was published June 26th, they would improve the benefit access and made them available in ESRD effective 1 January 2017, this year. Uh, it set, provided a savings of about $200 million, which when they were looking for money, it came in things. Yeah, you know, as soon as the Obama administration put this in their budget as a cost saver, we knew we had kind of won because they're, you know, in the budget neutral environment we live in right now, they're always looking for savers so that they can pay for something else they want to do. When I say they, I mean Congress. So we knew as long as, it, as soon as it was designated a saver, it was just a matter of time before this policy was going to get fixed. It didn't happen in the SGR fi fix bill. It happened, uh, instead it happened in the uh, trade bill. Okay, here's the rulemaking that came out last October. Uh, how do I phrase it? 
there are a lot of policies that are, that are subject to this rulemaking that are yet to be permanently defined. Is that a good way to put it? Yes, Dr. Garrett. I'm asking. Oh, where he's going with this is, uh, well, I think that's the next slide, actually. Yeah. Why don't we go through this one first? Okay. Um, again, it was paid as a facility payment as part of the PPS. Prospective payment system. system. Yeah. And the ba paid the base rate of 231.55. Uh, any non-renal drugs, biologics, lab services supplied may be billed separately. There is no num limit on the number of weekly or monthly sessions. Medicare limits ESRD to 13 or 14 monthly sessions. So there's no limit here. It does not cover home dialysis, although the question that I did receive, PD is covered, it just has to be in-center PD, IPD which I, somebody was talking about doing. Vaccinations, uh, hepatitis being a good example, are indeed covered. And this is being very, very, very closely monitored. I did just a quick comment on that because I had a nephrologist called me up a couple weeks ago and said, well, God, I could do 13 90935s in a month uh, because 90935 in the next slide is how you bill for that. And I was like, yeah, but if you submit 13 90935s in one month for an AKI patient, Number one, that's probably going to be flagged. And number two, if the whole community does that, then this benefit's probably going away because it's being abused. So we would urge people to be mindful about it. If you've got an acute patient that's, that's acute for a month, maybe you bill 90935 once a week or something like that. Remember, 90935 requires a face-to-face -face visit. And, and the full documentation requirements that you would do for 90935 in the inpatient setting. Uh, status quo is currently CPT 90935. There is a G code out there, but it was not implemented. The dialysis units are billing AKI on a G code, so that there may be some confusion there. Uh, change in this area is not impossible, and that is still in going on. And, and in, on a policy basis, it would make a lot of sense for CMS to establish a G code for this because you're going to have 90935 being used on an inpatient basis. So for them to differentiate it is probably a pretty good idea. It would make all their utilization tracking efforts a lot easier. So I'm sort of surprised they didn't do it. I'll bet they just couldn't get their ducks in a row enough for January 1st because I got an email from somebody at CMS on about December 30th that said, you know, after, after all that, we're not going to do it anyway. So, you know. Probably, probably coming in. Coming and they were getting the, the questions from both sides. So <clears throat> they were sort of forced into making a decision that uh, we'll see what happens. Affordable Care Act, uh, nobody knows where this is going. Uh, current administration says they're going to repeal and replace. Uh, they release their new plans very shortly. Uh, some parts of it are effective. Uh, some of parts of it are very controversial, uh, and where it goes and where it ends, nobody knows. And I'll leave it at that. Are there any questions? Rob, questions? Oh, oh sorry. I have a question that relates to telehealth. We're trying to confirm. I, I, I will vouch for the fact that I am not as conversant as I need to be, but go ahead. Okay. So we are starting to do telehealth, and we don't know if we're supposed to bill with the place of service O2 from the originating site or the distant site. And I've called CMS, and they told me, well, you, you can bill both. It depends on who you are, but they won't give me anything in writing. So I, have, I have had the same answer with the same question, and you now know all that I know. <laughs> well, I, and, and, you know, that's, that's a lesson for Medicare, period. You know, they're figuring that, you know, one thing I've learned about being the ESRD guy in the regulatory space, we've thought about this in levels of abstraction that CMS can't even dream of. I have to explain to them what ESRD means half the time. So, I mean, that, I mean, but that's a perfect example. You know, we've thought about this stuff because you all are nuts and bolts people who are doing this every day. We've thought about it to a level of detail that they haven't, and I'm, and I'm not even faulting them. They got the hardest job in the world, too. So, yeah, the, the point is what, what I told who asked me the question, okay? 
And I said, I don't have no data beyond what you just said. That I would suggest that they use the POS2 for the originating site, but also in their documentation establish that it's a qualified originating site. It just basically differentiates what care would be done in a federally qualified health clinic with its own POS, but you're doing a different thing in that, in that environment. Yes, ma'am? Yeah. Um, I have a question about CCM, and I know you talked about very few nephrologists are actually doing CCM for a whole lot of reasons, but I wondered if anybody here is doing CCM in their nephrology practice. You're doing it? Are you really? Okay. Are you successful at it? Oh, are you successful at it? Okay, and are the primary care doctors in the areas that you're doing it angry that you're doing it? I mean, they're not doing it, but now you're doing it, and are they, like, you're taking a piece of that pie from them? Do you, do you know what I mean? And so they're not caring. What about advanced care planning? Is anybody doing that? Yeah, brand new. Is anybody even thinking about doing it? Papers and, and, and staff staffing, but uh, so we have tried to utilize third party as much as possible in these uh, areas. Um, so, uh, advanced uh, care planning is uh, we have done in, in all of our ESRD population, and, and we are getting returns out of it too. And, and I would say, from a policy perspective, you wonder whether CMS learned a lesson from the ridiculous reimbursement they had for TCM and CCM, because the advanced care plan, it pays about 80 bucks a pop, and I think if you get into the next half hour, it goes up to 115 or something like that. So, CMS I want to make sure I understand the AKI billing correctly. It's the 90935. <laughs> But you're recommending you don't want to raise any red flags for the billing 13 of them in a two week period of time. to establish medical necessity for the visit. And you're talking about the dialysis center versus... No, I'm talking about the physician. Physician, but they're seeing them, every time they are doing rounds at the dialysis center, is that where the nine, nine, I understand the hospital. Okay. If they're seeing the patient while they're on rounds and they have the documentation that would fulfill 90935 and they have you know, medical necessity may be to find the fact that there is AKI, but since they're billing more than the 13, it may may pick up and say, wait a minute, why, why are you seeing these patients so many times? So that you may put yourself at a vulnerable, remember that these are being looked at, but if you can justify seeing that patient 13 times in a month or 14 times a month or how many times they dialyze, because there's no limit, if you can justify being there, seeing them, and have the documentation, the medical necessity, you can bill it as many times as you want. The exactly. two thirty-one fifty-five is. Per yeah. Okay. That's the G code okay. for the dialysis. Gotcha. 
So there's no difference in the reimbursement of the 9935 in the hospital versus the dialysis clinic? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Yeah, it's probably using the same. Okay. Regardless of uh, what we bill 13 times or not, I think it's a good uh, practice of medicine to see them more frequently because AKI usually recovers and you don't want to miss continue dialyzing somebody who is recovering kidney function and has, is already getting dehydrated by, you know, ATN recovers and then you have diuretic phase. Remember, there is no limit. There's no limit on the number of dialyses. There's no limit on the visits. However, you need to have the documentation that you would use for a standard 90935 visit and that would include, to a certain degree, medical necessity. That's absolutely the case. This is a test year for CMS. They're going to be figuring out a lot of stuff on this. And I will tell you, when we were submitting comments on this, we said, you got to realize these patients are much different or way different from ESRD patients and treat them accordingly. So I wouldn't argue the point about it's useful to see them as often as you can for sure, but just understanding from the billing perspective and CMS looking at that from, from those kind of perspectives, they're going to be paying a lot of attention to that. You better have good reason to see them. There has been a study done that the vast majority of these patients do quite well on three times a week. So, I just have a comment to make on the telehealth services. Our facility has been doing telehealth for um, a little bit now. And in the CMS manual and in, in several other, other publications, it does require that the originating site bills the same date. And we're coming into an issue where we've billed telehealth. We thought the originating site was billing telehealth. On an on a audit on those, the originating site did not turn in the HICFA for the telehealth. So just be careful if you're going to do it that you've really coordinated with that originating site. Thank you. I've seen that too. Uh, that's a good point. Others? Oh. <laughs> I'm going to earn my beer tonight. There are codes for nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities, et cetera, for consult visits. And those are the codes that you should use. You, if you are seeing the patient as part of their dialysis, like for peritoneal dialysis in a nursing home, then that's part of your MCP. But if you're seeing them for other reasons outside of that, just like an office visit, if it's not ESRD related, then you can perfectly appropriately bill it, but there are specific codes for billing in those environments. If there's nothing else, why don't, okay, one more question, then we'll take a half an hour break and come back with our case studies. Uh, some of this uh, AKI patient will recover, and some of them AKI on CKD who become dependent on dialysis will not recover. Is there any timeline, you know, that after, does it go, does it, should it go up for three months and only after that we can tell that this is ESRD, or if the clinically after two months, one and a half months, we say this is, this looks, this is a ESRD patient, it's not like, it's not gonna recover. So, what, is there any particular rule for them? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, I would not be surprised to see one in the future. Uh, we did a position paper on AKI, and we talked about that issue fairly carefully. And there's some patients that recover function after six months. So it was like 90 days wouldn't be the right number to have. So you really got to figure out. Now, we talked about the whole issue of when you sign the 2728 and when you're on solid ground. We say, hey, if in your clinical judgment they're end stage, then they're end stage. Feel free to sign it. So, you, you know, you shouldn't be worried, you know, CMS isn't criminalizing anybody for signing the 2728s. There was that period of time back when the, uh, when the hospital wanted to get the patient out 
and people would sign the 27, 28 because they were getting so much pressure to do that. We think the new policy kind of takes away that incentive. Now, it remains to be seen what other new incentives might emerge out of this. But for now, we think that previous incentive doesn't exist anymore. So you're probably free to, if you think they're, if they think they're ESRD, then 27, 28 them. If you think they might recover, then give it some time. Thank you. As, as long as you as a physician feel like the patient is AKI. Um, I will tell you something that we've talked about in length is like, when do you make the decision to make them AKI or ESRD? Because it does affect your billing, right? So if you've been seeing them the first couple of weeks as AKI and then you change them to ESRD, now they're MCP. So you really need to make sure you, you communicate back to your billing staff that Oh, the first two weeks they were AKI, but then I made them ESRD on 316. Right, but a lot of times doctor's offices don't get that information. So that's what I'm just saying. You, you know, please doctors communicate to your staff when you're, when you're going to change them. Actually, and that's not just about AKI. That's about everything. Doctors communicate to your staffs, please. In uh, a comment to what you said. Um, CMS is always very clear they do not want to practice medicine. Uh, that has been discussed at other levels. However, comma, I do expect if there is evidence of abuse that there will be some rulemaking that will basically require a redetermination point, if you will, where a decision has to be made to continue or to place them over and has to be justified. That, is, that would not surprise me in the least. Uh, I am not basing it on any information that I have that you don't have. Uh, I am just basing it on how I think things will work. That's just me. Okay, half hour break.